Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm very excited to be talking to Mr. Pat Master Lotto. How the devil are you? I'm okay, sleepy, but yeah, I'm okay. You just finished four nights? Three. Three, Three nights? Two shows a night though. I haven't done two, you know, we played an hour and a half twice. It was amazing. My hands kind of hurt in the middle of the night. I, that usually doesn't happen. I've got, I've got to be honest, for, for, for guys of your stature to be playing the baked potato or as the the known, the people in the know call it the spud. Yeah. That's pretty darn cool to play, play that little club like that. I, my hat's off to you. Uh, good, good. I mean, I was always intimidated by the place because that was a jazz or fusion place when sure. I lived here. So I would sneak in late and sit in the corner and be afraid they might call jam session or something. <laughs> but it's like, uh, I mean, what is it, 50 people and it's packed? Yeah, I don't know how they make the money. It was an absolutely incredible show. This is, oh, by the way, it's Stickman. To see you guys do like level five and that was insane. Oh. Yeah, that was insane. I'm glad it reached you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what, what a wealth of experience. Let's go back. You were born in uh, Chico? Chico, California, Northern California. Were you already playing in bands there or did it happen when you moved to LA? No, no, it already happened up there. I yeah. started to play when I was about 10. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was about 15, uh, I was playing with the guys that were at Chico State College. So I was still in high school and because uh, I couldn't drive in the beginning. By the time I was 16, we had bar gigs. I was playing five nights a week. Wow. Because uh, I could walk into this club and make a left and be on stage. So we were doing, you know, five sets a night kind of stuff, maybe at three nights a week, I'm not sure. And then branched out, we uh, all over Northern California and Lake Tahoe and stuff like that. And uh, that whole band moved down to the Bay Area uh, when I was 17 and we were East Bay and lasted a few more months and the band was breaking up. I was wondering what, where to go with my life. And uh, I had a Rolling Stone magazine that said, future concerts and I could see in LA Crimson. I'd just seen Crimson at the Cow Palace. I was mad for King Crimson from eighth grade. I heard cat food in a public library with headphones. So wait there, so you're, you're, you're a massive Crimson fan yeah. and you end up playing with them? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Since amazing. a very early age. And uh, so anyway, that's... I'm a huge fan. I haven't ended up playing with them. I, I don't know how these <laughs> things happen. But I, I moved to LA in part because I could see in a week or two, they would be a headliner. I saw them open for 10 years after at the Cow Palace. So when I moved to LA, the week or two after that was when they played at the Shrine. It was a ton of great shows. It was Gentle Giant at the Whiskey and mm -hmm. Surround Sound. It was Return to Forever doing uh, uh, Romantic Warrior at the Troubadour. An odd story that I, I had some drug issues and my mother was down here. She wanted to have the one, the talk. We, <laughs> we did that at the Source, which used to be on Sunset Boulevard. And she looked over and she spotted John McLaughlin. She said, there's that, that guy you like. And, like, and she's like, go talk. I'm like, I'm not going to go talk to him. So she does. She goes over there and John gives me the come over and mom tells you you like the band. And I say, yeah, I love the band. And he says, you'd like to see the band? I said, well, you're playing Long Beach, but I just moved here. I didn't know where I started, got stuck in traffic. I never got to your gig last night or whatever. He said, well, we're playing again day after tomorrow, just right up the street at this new place called The Roxy. Oh, wow. And uh, I said, oh, he said, would you like to come? He said, well, I'm underage. I can't. Uh, he said, I'll leave you a, a ticket. Uh, back, that was my first back, not backstage, but a uh, guest list. That's a nice first. Guest Unbelievable, list. huh? Yeah, yeah. You only been in LA for a matter of days, uh, weeks maybe, weeks. but yeah, not long, not long at all. And uh, my seat was here. I mean, I was like, uh, you know, couldn't been any closer. The section opened, so Russ Kunkel right there, and then God incredible, him. yeah, and Leland, and yeah, yeah it's magic. So yeah, I'd already been playing, and it was my dream to be a session player, but I didn't really know what that meant. What it meant to me was like seeing Derek and the Dominoes. Here's uh, uh, Jim Gordon. He's with George Harrison. He's with Jackson Brown. Well, Russ, you know, they're jumping. That'd be the ultimate gig, being five bands or something. So that's the way I looked at it. Uh, well, you've managed to you managed to basically do that. I kind of did, but yeah, um, yeah. So my my note is that that's. Uh, 1973. My next note is worked with Mike Chapman. How did that come about? Was playing with a girl named Shandy, and we were uh, a Monday night gig at the Blah Blah that used to be down on Ventura Boulevard, and we developed a reputation, and people started to come to get her a record deal. And simultaneously, I've been working with Holly Penfield. She's a girl from San Francisco. 
had been managed by Bill Grange. I think she was with Bud Prager then that had Foreigner. I was with both those acts. And uh, Mike Chapman got a label through RSO, Dreamland. He signed uh, two acts and Nicky signed two acts. So then they have the people come in and he finds out he's got the same drummer. Mike signed Shandy and Nicky signed Holly. So Nice. Yes, yeah, so something you could just kind of talk about. There's a little rub. So Chinny Chap, they each sign yes. two different artists and you're the drummer for both. Yes. And from New York, they signed the Nervous Rex and Spider that had Holly Knight and uh, Anton Fig and those guys. So there was immediately a problem. They brought me in the office. Uh, like we'd already negotiated our guitar player for Holly's band, we were going to be on $200 a week retainers. Could it have been that much? Maybe it was $200 a month. I can't, but it was a check just for rehearsing all the time. It was money. Yeah. So they, they, they said, you got to decide. And uh, I chose to stick with Holly it was anyway. And then, uh, and then Shandy had issues with the other drummer. That's how I ended up going back to Shandy. They released me for two weeks to do Shandy's record. And that's when we skipped out to see XTC at the, uh, Whiskey. Did you get to hang out and talk with XTC? Did you build a relationship with them then? No, not really at all. A weird thing was that we did, uh, through my ex, uh, get in the dressing room. That was an awkward experience. I was kind of <laughs> a fly on the wall, but she was quite uh, active with everybody. But that had no connection to what happened later. I saw him later at the Santa Monica Civic. They opened for Oingo Boingo. And then... Uh, uh, well, anyway, it had nothing to do with that. I, I was at their show at the Palladium when Andy didn't come out. Uh, right. And I was with Wolf and Rissmiller as a guest with the promoters. So I was privy to the action of them trying to get Andy out of the hotel room. I remember production manager walked and said, I know you love this band, but they are f***ing us. I said, because the stage was already set. You know, the big English mm. settlement is down and everything, and Andy wouldn't come out of his room. So the connection to XTC happened through Paul Fox. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Paul and I had done a lot of things together, starting with sessions as sidemen. Amazing. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, I thought he was bullshitting when he calls. I got another record to work on together, and I said, who is it? XTC. No way. No way. Yeah, would Paul Fox, kind of keyboards, kind of very, I suppose, synonymous with 80s production, and then suddenly it's like XTC, which yeah. is very organic, rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. And he told me then, he says, well, you got a lot of work to do. Check your mailbox. There should already be tapes. He'd sent over three cassettes. So whatever that would be, like 30 songs or well, more to to prepare. He said, like, maybe they're coming in three weeks or something. Uh, so they didn't really know me. He 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 told Paul told me right up. He said, you know, if this doesn't go down, I'm going to let you go. You know, we'll see how it goes. We rehearsed. We rehearsed together for a week and a half or two weeks at Leeds, so. Uh, I remember Leeds on Wellington. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he always, Paul also told me right then, he says, you're not gonna play on every track. He says, I wanna get Vinny on a track and I wanna get Tony Williams on a track. And then because we got ahead of schedule cutting the basics, they said, let's just have a go at this. Uh, Chocos and Children was the one Tony Williams was supposed to get. So you're working with Paul Fox. He gives you a call for the XTC yeah. gig. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. You'd already seen the band, and presumably yeah. you're a big fan. I am a big, huge fan. Well, I knew we were going to rehearse for a few weeks. Uh, so like I said, we were, we were at Leeds there, and uh, I knew the old songs. So in between, I could play Nigel or No Thugs or something, and they were like, oh, he knows that, and play along. Uh, it was magic, man. They, they're just so good. And we had that rehearsal time, and we tracked it Ocean Way in the big room in uh, one, I think they call that. Uh, we did a pace of about a song or two a day. So, we, you know, you get a track and set up the next track and then finish it in the morning, that kind of thing. Incredible. Uh, so we got ahead of schedule. I think we cut 15, 17. It's, it's a lot of tracks on that record and a couple that weren't used. Yeah, disappointed we couldn't tour. It seemed like there might be a possibility to tour after that record. They had a new manager then, Tarkin Gulch. Tarkin that does some film stuff. Um, so he was working hard to they were going to do they did do a radio tour they were going to have me come over and do in the studio with small audience to try and get andy comfortable to uh you know play in front of people again but they're hilarious now, andy's completely outgoing funny guy i know, can imagine have, yeah it's just such a classic band because of course andy's incredibly talented and a great songwriter but so is colin colin's yeah. a wonderful songwriter yeah yeah and there's you know there's a little rub there 
uh, between them uh, in a good way. But uh, yeah, and Dave's great. The whole the whole thing was awesome, awesome. And Andy's got great uh, ears and feel. They both do. I mean, the record. Some of the stuff is cut with a click. Some without a click. And some built up separate pieces. You know, uh, pay, play different pieces of the kit at one at a time. I would love to have been a fly on the wall in that session because, like I said, on paper, I would never have put Paul Fox as a producer of it. And like you said, you, when you got the call, you were quite surprised. Yeah, well, you know how Paul got the gig? Sort no, of? I don't. He had done uh, some remixes of Yes, and he was, or XTC was in somebody's office and heard those, and they were just in this discussion who would be the next producer. And as you probably know, they hated, or Andy hated the the deal with Todd, that was uh, Skylark, a great, incredible record, but he and Todd didn't get along. Anyway, this list of producers kept coming up and they didn't know who, and I think it was Dave Gregory that suggested, or they heard the, the uh, I'm sorry, Davis who suggested Todd because Andy didn't know Todd. Uh, but Paul Fox, they'd heard this other track. Oh, it was maybe Boy George, actually. It might have been. Uh, wow. It was some kind of pop track that he completely did a 12-inch remix, and they said, oh, this is a very creative guy. So, and then they had some meetings, and they liked them. There's some, there's some video footage of different uh, recordings, some stuff with Steve Lee Wyatt, I think some stuff with Hugh as well. well. Remarkable when I watch it is it's very, it's very British. It's very like, oh, I, you know, why don't you try? Oh, yes, I should try that. And all very polite. And uh, was, it, was, it, was it still like that by the time they were making it? Uh, yeah, but they drink, especially Andy. So, okay. so you know, a few beers and uh, things were different. Uh, that's where his humor just spews out. Surprised me that Dave, Dave wrote charts. So we'd rehearse the stuff and then he's doing like the Wawa solo on Merely a Man. I see he's reading a chart. He's written his whole routine out, you know. It's like, it's an unusual. I thought you just played by feel, but. I didn't. I sat next to Andy. Sometimes he'd he'd be playing stuff on the piano, and uh, I said, "Oh, that sounds like it came in through the bathroom window or something." He go, "Oh, actually, it's if you just move this finger over." He'd show me how he arrived at some of his chord progressions, and uh, you know, pulling from the classics. John told me, Lecky told me that um, they would just jam Zeppelin as though they'd known it their whole lives. Like he, they, uh, he was like, know. he was like they they just knew how to play the classics. Uh, probably, but I didn't know that. I mean, I remember he, we were at Leeds, and he he knocked on the wall and had a, a real thumb. He said, that, "That's the kick sound I want." It was for scarecrow people, scarecrow people, mm -hmm. just a knock on the wall. And he, he knew the sounds he wanted. He wanted all the he wanted the snare drums to be in pitch of the tune. So uh, uh, we, we had spent time with one guy at the piano, one guy in the control room, one guy with me, trying to, you know decide what would be the best. And then I had made some samples then that were in like a Casio or a early Akai sampler. And one of them I had done, I just held the drum or maybe between my legs and held the mic and hit the drum. And it didn't have any transient. It was just the hum, the sing of the drum, you know, the, the ring. So we put that in on almost all. That's part of the snare sound of that record is this, uh, that we could tune that ring in with the track. Nice. Uh, yeah. It was very smart. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I suppose that's something to really talk about, because by the time you get into Crimson, you're playing V-drums. Not in the beginning. With no? Crimson V-drums, no. Not really in the beginning? No, not when I started with Bill, no. I would have had my Simmons SDS-5 uh, in those days, in Sylvian's record. I was still lugging that around, and samplers. But there were no V-drums until about... Uh, 2000. You co-founded Mr. Mister in 82? Uh, I'm not sure the year, but probably 82-ish. And I didn't really co-found it. That was They were called Pages. Okay. They, they'd been signed by Bobby Columbia, the drummer that was with Blood, Sweat and Tears, who became an A&R guy. He signed Jaco Pistorius. He was, with, he was at Epic, so he signed them for Epic. They did two records at Epic, and then he moved to Capitol uh, and Bobby Columbia and took them with him to Capitol. So when I met them, they were going to do their second record for Capital. That's what I auditioned for. Uh, in fact, my, you know Kim Bullard? Kim, Kim, I know Kim, yeah. We're, we met when we were 17, 18, we first got to town. So Kim was the one who called me. So she should call uh, George Giz, was the manager, who lived on Lookout. Yeah, so I was really nervous. I was like, well, I, I can't play this Vinny stuff. That's Vinny played on the third Pages record. Sure. Uh, Jay Graydon produced it. 
So very slick. It wasn't, I didn't really like it, to be honest. Right. Um, so I, I told the manager, I, I don't think I'm really the, or I told Kim, I said, I don't think I'm the guy for this gig. And Kim said, oh, they want to change everything. They want to be like, more like self-contained, like hollow notes, rich and slug up front and a contained backup band. So we actually auditioned uh, on Ventura Boulevard. I think it's a vintage guitar place now. I drove by it yesterday or last night. Um, and I was supposed to bring a bass player. I brought James Rolleston, who'd been playing with Rye Cooter then and John Hyatt. And he got a toothache and didn't show up. So that's why Richard Page pulled the bass down to audition me. Mm. And, um, and w I was on a lunch break from a straight gig. I was uh, doing envelopes, you know. Actually, we wow. could stamp them with a wet pad. It was me and Cliff Martinez, who was the Chili Pe Pe Peppers drummer then, and uh, Robin Williams, three out-of-work drummers with girlfriends that worked at this magazine place. <laughs> and so I slipped away for an hour and auditioned. And um, anyway, that's... The, and then we uh, we changed the name pretty soon, quickly there. You know, they, they realized it wasn't the same vibe as Pages and... Uh, Incredible. Yeah. So you're an out of work drummer now joining a band that had absolutely massive hit singles. Well, not right away. Yeah. No, no, no. Tell us about that journey then. Well, the first record was a pretty big flop, I guess, disappointment. Uh, let me think how that all well, that was that was Peter McKeon who did Minute Work and he had the big so when I auditioned actually, the day I auditioned, which was only about an hour. Uh, in walks the manager. He sees Rich playing bass and that we're a four piece. He goes, love it. Peter McKean shows up because he was interested in producing the next pages. He says, oh, four pieces is great. Bobby Columbia comes in. They're an A&R guy. Same thing. Love it. It was a fourth character. It was a booking agent guy from like William Morris or one of the big, same thing. So it was like high five, you're in the band. There was no, we'll call you tomorrow and let you know. Incredible. It was pretty incredible and quick. And, uh, we did a few gigs and made that record at Westlake with Peter McKeon. And Peter wanted me to use the Minute Work guy's drums, and he wanted to use all timbales. So we bought these little timbales, or bigger and larger. I set up cockeyed. So he wanted me to move my kit around to stereofy. I guess my toms were off center to the kick. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. And he built these baffles around all my drums, like between each drum, between the kick, you know, between the hi-hat box, you know what I mean. He wanted separation. <laughs> Absolute separation to, wow. to the max. He wanted me to use black dot heads. Uh, I used black, I used all, every thing he wanted. I'll go down and try what you want. He wanted a 57 on the snare drum to the black dot. Mm -hmm. So boom, bam, boom, there goes the capsule. Yeah. Next track. And I'm new with the misters. Like, Pat, the drummer's got red light fever. He's not doing well once the red light comes on. I'm hitting the microphone, snare mic, till there was no more 57 at uh, Westlake. <laughs> and, I, and then they don't need that last piece of plastic. You know, the capsule ends before that. Yep. So he came in and put it. I said, can't you just give me back that inch? Because your plastic was, Yeah. So that's really, because I'd already been making records with Mike, where it's like, put the mics further away, open drum sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a real thumpy sounding record to me. We did a few things on the loading bay late at night, but it was a disappointing record, drum-wise, I thought, really disappointing, and sales-wise. So the next record we got with Paul Devillier, that's where we found our Was that Welcome to the Real World? Yes. Right. And they let us co-produce ourselves with Paul. Great. So we did, got a little chunk of change, went to Ocean Way and cut three tracks. One of them was, Ocean, was uh, Broken Wings, was one of the first tracks we cut. Incredible. Yeah. Which is an amazing song and a huge hit. Yeah. So it was great. It was back in the days where actually people would give you a second chance. You do an album and it... Yeah. Absolutely. So, what, what, and, and the sense of pages, they'd already had three unsuccessful records. So, you know, people kept believing in them and... That's amazing. I mean, rich and slug, they're super, you know, super talent. Five years from there, 85 to 90, is it touring? That the must have been quite intense uh, with, with a couple of massive hit singles. Well, we didn't tour that much because Richard Page didn't enjoy touring. Ah, uh, interesting. So, uh, uh, so we, we, we had a massive tour with Tina Turner. And that's when we arced up to number one. That was like seven weeks. And then not many, we, we carried on, but there were many other gigs. Cock Robin, Peter Kingsbury was an old friend. I did a lot of the Cock Robin stuff. Um, I can't, well, once I had a hit, then the phone would ring more. Like, I don't know what, vanity.
stuff like that. So. Yeah. So you left in 1990 and went straight really quite intensely into session work, of course, which is, I mean. Well, just whatever came. I mean, I would always, the session work before that was usually $50 demo, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So it, it elevated to real sessions. I mean, the list is pretty intense. Uh, XTC, Sugar Cubes. Uh, Sugar Cubes was Paul again. And I yeah. just did overdubs. They, they had their own drummer. Ziggy's great. So he brought me in for a couple of days. That was typically the thing with Paul. Come down for a day, help me fix a few things. Mm. Hall of Notes? That was one track that uh, Richard Page had written with Dave Tyson. And we did it at uh, Sound Factory or Sunset Sound. Sound Factory. Yeah. It's a couple of standout ones. Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau was a session at Jay Graydon's house. Al was never there. I just did mm -hmm. beatbox stuff. Uh, it was a song Richard Page had written. That's the same with Patti LaBelle, Pointer Sisters. Most of that stuff was uh, beatbox-driven stuff. I, had, I got the Lindrum. When I auditioned for the Misters, they'd been auditioning drummers for quite a while, so they bought a Lindrum. And then when I came, they hit go on the Lindrum, and i play along. And then when we finished, like I say, this one-hour audition, uh, they let me take the Lindrum. They said, hey, we don't need... Don't need we've anymore. You. We've got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I got... I couldn't afford it then. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Tina Arena, Julia Fordham. Uh, Tina Arena was Dave Tyson again. Uh, Julia Fordham. That was a TV show. It was... Uh, they couldn't get their visas, like a holiday weekend, and the band got stuck. So she just had her keyboard player. Oh, wow. And then, yeah. So it, it, she was on Virgin, right? Maybe it came through Virgin. Right. And then, of course, the Rembrandts, we were just talking about that. I mean, Danny was there last night, actually. Uh, oh, really? Half a Rembrandt. Uh, yeah, they go way back. Danny's solo record. You know, Danny was in Great Buildings or The Quick, if you knew them, kind of Kim Fowley punk band stuff. So I'd met him back then in uh, a singer in my prog band. I almost got in a fight with him in a little rehearsal room we shared. So I remember Danny when I met him later and uh, did a couple of his records and solo records. He was on Geffen and Island. Yeah, in fact, he saw, I wouldn't know what Chris Blackwell looked like. He saw Chris Blackwell and had a cassette in his pocket and gave it to him. <laughs> and that's where he got his, his record deal with Island. Um, yeah, so in and out of that gig with the Rembrandts. Uh, What's the jump off point? Because you're a Crimson fan from when you were a teenager. But the stuff we're talking about here is very... Americana or folky. Or pop, like yeah. pop, you know, um, or in R&B-ish, you know, Points of Sisters, Patty, all absolutely fantastic music, don't get me wrong. But no, and Mr. Mister was a straight ahead pop rock band with massive hits and everything. But if somebody says to you, well, now you're going to play drums on the Sylvian Fripp live album, Damage Live, how does how do you go from that? Well, there's no direct connection, man. I just I like music, and when it's and I love pop music. I got no. I, I, oh, it's no, the it's, Beatles. It's I it's all it. super valid. But I'm just thinking how how did you how did you hook up with uh, it's David just and Robert? The opportunities that arrived. Uh, mm -hmm. the, meeting Robert was too bizarre, man. I I had uh, because the Rembrandts we recorded stuff at home. I had those blackface eight ads in those days. Yep. And remember them well. Yes. I was selling a DBX compressor, like a 160. Is that what it was? Yeah. And I put it in the recycler magazine for sale, $200 or question, trade for a question mark. And I see down there somebody selling a, a Leslie cabinet, $200 trade for a question mark. I call the guy up and so we swapped. We swapped. That was Bill Forth, who was at the gig also last night. And uh, he had been, he was a crafty guitar player. You know about the crafties? That mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'd seen those shows as well. Um, in fact, I tried to get some of the crafties into the misters after Steve Ferris left. Uh, uh, I rang up through the number on the gray cassette. And it was, anyway, I got the Leslie. Bill calls me later. He says, oh, I forgot to give you the fast, slow, the, the, the pedal on off. So he stopped by my house, and that would have been Thursday evening, because it came out on Thursdays. And that's when he happened to mention, hey, you're a drummer, you know, my friend Trey and these guys are playing with uh, Sylvia Fripp, and they're going to need a drummer. Jerry's not going to do the tour. And I go, who, who do I call? What do I do? And he goes, oh, I don't really know management. I just know about Trey. So I called Trey. 
cold call. I said, hey, what's this deal with this audition I'm a guy out in L.A. you don't know? He says, kind of like says, fuck off. I'm busy. I'm getting on a plane. Can't help you. Auditions are Monday. This is Friday. Uh, somehow he let me know the manager, Opium Arts, uh, Richard Chadwick. So I called him over in England. Must have been closing time, you know, Friday <laughs> evening. So I'm this guy in L.A. I'd like to see about getting an audition. I heard there's auditions. And he said, oh, you're in L.A. It's impossible. We're not going to fly you over. I said, no, if I can get myself there, could I get an audition? And he said, well, well actually, he, di he didn't say that. He, he said something and, and maybe hung up or called me back. I think he called somebody because I already done next DC. Yeah. So he knew people at Virgin. He probably called somebody at Virgin and said, is this guy legit or whatever he did. XTC is kind of a, a gateway drug for all of us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you can be a prog head and love XTC. You can be a pop fan. You can love XTC. Yeah. You can be rock. They're musicians. We love that band. I did too. Yeah. Neck and neck dancing straight off and forevermore. Yeah. Um, so that's the weird way this audition happened was I went over and, and got the audition on Monday. I was the first drummer in. Uh, I didn't ever think I'd get the gig, and uh, yeah, we can go into a lot of detail on that, blah, blah, blah. So I get home, and I get the phone call, you've got the gig, spent whatever that would have been, six months or a year around Robert, rehearsing and touring, and then went home at Christmas, and he called uh, a week or two later, said he's had the vision for two drummers in Crimson, and yeah. And how's that? You're going to be you and... Bill. Bill. Yeah. yeah. I said, what does Bill think about that? And he, <laughs> he said, well, we're not settled on that. And uh, I was just leaving the following day because uh, I said to Robert, I said, you know, this isn't, this could be very uncomfortable. Uh, you're asking us to get married. We've never kissed. You know, <laughs> we, 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 we need to have some meeting. And I said, I'm going to Japan like tomorrow, the next day with, it was Jay Graydon's band with, I uh, can't think who else, but a lot of people you would know, Bill Chaplin in the band. So we did these maybe two weeks in Japan and then we went to Sweden. It was Japan and Sweden, West Coast music. Um, and so I said, Robert, I'll be coming through Amsterdam in a month. And so we set up a way to meet up at Bruford's house. And uh, that's the first day we did an afternoon there. I want to make an observation, personal. Okay. I feel like you and Bill are cut from the same cloth, though, because both of you play very technically but with feel and groove. Most people that play, dare I say, prog, tend to only lean on the, on the technical. You've got a great feel and groove. I mean, we, we enjoyed the show the other night, and, and, and yeah, I've, I saw you play with the, I think I saw you at, it's been 90... Anyway, I saw the double, double drums with Trey and with Tony, and I think it was yeah. out at Royal Albert Hall, I think. Uh, we did. We did two or three nights. One of them was Bill Bruford's birthday, if you remember. Uh, I, can't, I don't think it was his birthday, unless I forgot, but I, I, I saw that, that tour and I saw those shows. And no, it was magic because we did. It was amazing. We did uh, Indiscipline. Da, da, and yep. I do remember one thing. It's Bill Bruford's birthday. Adrian yep. did that at Royal Albert Hall, so it was great. It was the second of two days, and we might have played three. We'd also played there with David Sylvian, maybe two nights. Um, so it was the second I saw time. that tour as well. Oh. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing there is that we were offered to do, Letterman was doing one week in London that week, and somebody canceled. And that was our second night at Royal Albert Hall. Is that what it was? So we had the opportunity anyway to shoot over and do the Letterman show, but Robert wouldn't do it because we had, we uh. would have missed our sound check. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing for me is when you've got two drummers that are playing complicated parts, but they're gro they've got groove and feel, it works. If you play really complicated parts and they're playing like gridded machines and one goes slightly out of time, it's like a cacophony of disaster. Do you know what I mean? You can sort of yeah. breathe. I know you know what you mean. <laughs> You're a world-class drummer. You can, br you can breathe in, out in and outside of each other. Yeah. But when it's so unbelievably mathematical, it turns into a disaster when there's any kind of tension whatsoever. You guys, it was a phenomenal show. I remember my friend Nick is a, is a great bass player himself and we were floored. We didn't think it was going to work to be honest. And you're just talking about when there are two drummers. Now yeah. you imagine three. I didn't see you with three. Uh, I, was already living, I was already living in L.A. Yeah, by that time. We had to be then. very scripted and organized, you know. What was the process of you and Bill when you got together to b work out how to play with the two of you? Ooh. <laughs> You've never been asked that question well, only a hundred no. times. 
You, you know, it's apparent to me, first off, the material. Like some elephant talk doesn't need a second drummer. Right. You know, I could add a cowbell. It's like, I love watching Bill play. I don't want, I didn't. <laughs> so we really only had the new material. Right. It was the stuff off of Room and, and the Thrack record to play together. And some of the stuff from Jamie Muir days, mm -hmm. Lark, but some of the more, dis the stuff off Discipline was really lean and perfect. So I was a third wheel maybe on some of that stuff, at least as far as, anyway. So I think maybe if we had a working relationships, it was that, uh, Bill, you do your thing and I'll find something to work around it, you know? Oh, of course, I was talking to David Bottrell the other day. That was a funny memory, him dancing to Thrack in the control room. That was all good. Oh, the first time down? Uh, well, just, yeah, even the first time down. I'm not sure we played that more than once or twice. I you think know, he said you did it once. Yeah, with Robert, things go really fast. Yeah. Really, really fast. When we did the Vroom record, uh, Bottrell came up. We rehearsed a week. I guess we were at Applehead in Woodstock. And Bottrell came up the second week and then realized that he needed an extender to the desk, like a little Melbourne or something. And then he needed the cables. And so every day we were supposed to track for a week or whatever, but maybe the third day I came in and uh, was going to change my drum heads and they were doing overdubs on what we played Monday and Tuesday. So they had enough on tape that Robert was happy and we were, we were like, that's the track, you know? David told me that, I think he said it was one take on Thrack. He said, uh, guys played it, came in, I went, yeah, I really like that. Um, and then Bill says, oh, can you just go to like bar 137 and punch in beat, you know, five, six and seven or whatever. And, and, and David says, I've just heard the song. Yes. I don't know where you mean. That was up at Applehead. That was up at Applehead. <laughs> Absolutely. If anybody knows Thrack, in fact, just we should have a link underneath. Then they'll understand what it must be like to be an engineer. Well, half the band's in five and half's in seven. Exactly. So you do, you do align, yeah. <laughs> For an engineer that's, uh, you know, who's not heard the track before, that's quite overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, punching in those days, as you knew, was an art. Yeah. Like, that's an XTC story I can think of, which is President Kill. Uh, they weren't there. I had done the parade drum and the marching stuff while they were at dinner, maybe. And Dave is diabetic, so he had to go back to the apartment. So... They maybe didn't come back that night, but we were going to do the main drumming the following morning, so we were just getting the sound up, and we ran a take, and me and Paul goes, that sounds like a take, you know, uh, except for a place to fix it. Uh, there was one fix to do, and that's the punch that I'm remembering, which was, we're just going to fix this backbeat. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to fix the backbeat and the cymbal, and now we're going to fix a bar, two bars. You know, it got bigger and bigger as sure. the punch out didn't work, but we eventually got it. And then they came in the next morning, and so they signed off on that uh, take was done in the evening without them. Correct me if I'm wrong, but David said that when Vroom was done, it, it was it sort of negotiated a deal or something that would do the EP but own it, and then uh, the album itself was through a label. Yeah. Um, so it was almost, I suppose, kind of the audition for the album? When Thrack was done, was that already written in, in stone that you were going to do the album? S sort of. When, when, mm -hmm. when Robert called me that he's seen the vision of Two Drummers and Crimson and all this, yep. he laid out the calendar for three years. He says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up to Woodstock in the spring. We're going to go up the first time and we're going to record and make an EP. We'll go back up there a month or so later to rehearse some of the repertoire from the older material. Then we'll go to South America. We'll do this month in Argentina uh, and work in the material, play it live and continue the writing process. We did a lot of that uh, down there in Argentina in this big theater so we could rehearse and record and then sit out in the audience and listen to the PA like that. And uh, and then he said, when we finish that, then we'll go to real world, we'll make the record. And that was so. The, and then the tour was already planned for the following February. So Robert in those days had a, like a, it was a small a pocketbook, notebook, but it mm -hmm. pulled out for three years, his calendar. Incredible. That's, that's, way, that's why when, and I already knew that from working with him with Sylvian. Uh, that's why when he said, I said, we got to test the water, Robert, before me and Bill are, you know. There's a man who knows what he wants, though. Yeah, he does quickly. I mean, just, just like he makes really quick decisions. The Thrak album, how long does that take to make? 
Uh, well, we did that over in England at Real World, and I think I was there two weeks at the most. We had one great night where, oh, it's Guy Fox Day. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't celebrate it, but, you know. November the 5th. Okay, so it was November the 5th, mm -hmm. and must have been the night before. Maybe we took two or three days off there because probably Bill and Robert went home. So I took Adrian and Trey to meet to Swindon. We went and hung out with Andy. And, Incredible. Yeah, and Andy's little potting shed in the back. Uh, so small. I hung with Marianne. It wasn't Marianne. He was with a different... He, his marriage had fallen apart. Uh, but he and Trey and Adrian jamming in the... Yeah, it was great. And then they came to Guy Fox Day. The next day they came out to Real World. I think it was just Andy, possibly Dave, but not Colin. Wonderful. Yeah, so uh, real world. Yeah, we had a lot of trouble with the headphones when we started track. Originally, I was in the wood room. You know how big the place is, right? It's enormous. You, you, that yeah. control room is like and, biggest in the world or something. And Bruford was in the stone room, which is attached to the other control room. And then... Uh, because they had to, we just couldn't get a decent headphone mix. There wasn't enough juice or somehow they're too far from the power distribution. Mm. So eventually we switched. Or maybe Bill wasn't happy originally. That's what it was. He wasn't happy with sight lines. So right. Bill moved into the wood room where Trey and Robert and Adrian would have been visible. Tony, I think, was in the control room. Maybe not visible to anybody. And so put me in the stone room with the monitor. And I could just see a little, little bit of Bill down there and a little <laughs> Adrian's nose. Uh, I, I don't think I could see Robert. So that was a little awkward. And because I was louder than Bill, they got complaints. Um, Cronus Quartet were mixing okay. in, in that room. So they said, you know, you, you got to tell your drummer to quiet down or uh, <laughs> we'll take a break at, you know, 12 o'clock. Or whenever their break was, we would rush in and try to, if I was overdubbing or doing something... So you just said um, he had planned out going to Argentina. Yes. So, of course, that was, uh, would, would that be the result of the B-Boom uh, live in Argentina? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Robert had that whole plan, and, and I guess he had raised enough money off one record to make the next one happen. Uh, you know, self-financed. But the Virgin deal came with Thrack. There's loads of stuff to talk about. Of course, of course you've got Project 4. How did that sort of come about? Um, you, did Bill just, was he just wanted to sort of take a break at that point? And he wanted... No, not quite yet. No, no we'd, we'd, we'd stop maybe in 97. Mm -hmm. And I thought we'd have about a year break because I went, I tried to go to a University of Texas and take uh, some music classes, but I didn't have a diploma. <laughs> so I had to take <laughs> night classes. But I found a tabla teacher and a kanjir teacher, and I took vocal lessons and some tap dancing and all this stuff, trying to get my game together before we came back to meet again as a band. And I think Is that something that Robert inspires in people, you think? Mm, His learning, the way he... Maybe, but I, I might have done it for... You know, reasons. you, if you were my artist and you said, oh, and I realized, oh, I could improve my scene and be sure. better for this guy. So, uh, but I remember that. And we did have this rehearsal in Nashville that ended uncomfortably. Uh, and the intention, Robert told me before we went there, I don't want to get anything done, just start new ideas, which we did. But uh, by the end of that, he, I think he and Bill were pretty much done. But I'm trying to remember where the projects fell in that line because the projects came out of order. And that's why I know where the V-drums fit in because mm -hmm. Project 2 was the first... Pro so Robert already said, we're going to do these research and development. We'll just improv. The pointed stick of public ridicule, you will come up with something. So it started because Adrian pulled out his V drums and immediately played, and Robert, oh, this is magic, you know. So they were a trio, Robert, Trey, and uh, and that was Project Two, which has the note chase feature, you know, on the on the V drums where you can, yeah. So because Adrian's always first, those were the factory presets he's playing. It's like hey. so that came first. Then there was a Project One, which was Bill it was played. Bill brought xylophones. They did a gigs at some place in London. Jazz Cafe? Could there mm -hmm. be a place to call it? Okay. Yeah. I think I came over and saw one of their shows, and that was Tony and Bill and Trey and Robert. And then, then did we do four? We did four next, which uh, we started up in Colorado, went down the coast. That was with me. And I, I was going all electric by then. I knew he liked the V-drums. I knew he liked low volume, you know, have a conversation while we're writing and uh so I had some Clavia D drums and wave drums. So it wasn't just the V drums. 
it was quite an extensive array of samplers, the little 303s and phrase samplers and the groove box and an 808 or all those things. Uh, so I could incorporate all that stuff and, and a little bit on Project 4, but Project 3 even more because we played in Texas, yeah. We played at South by Southwest, uh, yeah. I didn't know you played South by Southwest. Yeah, we, as the, that was our one gig. Yeah, we had a warm-up gig. We went up to Dallas. Maybe I did, but I didn't go. I wish I had. <laughs> ah, we also, let me think how that... Well, one thing, I, Robert made me the road manager, so I had to get the hotels for the guys to come over and get the opening act. So that's where I found, or found, I didn't find him, but where I learned about Kimo Pahoan, the Finlandish recording. He was the opening, because I didn't want a guitar band in front of us. So I was looking for, uh, I found a flamenco guitar player to be the support and Kimo uh, to be the support. And, and because it was in my home base, I could take the recordings from the gig and go home and drop them into blackface eight ads probably or some two track editing thing and uh, be able to come back the next day and say, oh, hey, look, we could put this to that. Or Project 10, the Heaven and Earth album. Oh, well, that was totally different. That was, we were making Construction Light record and that's a exception uh, with, with Crimson. Robert likes to learn the material, rehearse the material, play the material live and and change it, embellish it, and then go in the studio and record quickly. Uh, it didn't go that way on Construction Light. He'd already committed that we would do a tour the following year. And so we started around September, October, and knew we had to be done by December and didn't have any material. So we're starting pretty much, well, some of the threads that came out of the projects uh, became some of the foundational pieces, but uh, we recorded at Adrian's house uh, in the basement there using V-drums. And, oh yeah, they were, well, Robert likes to be done by five o'clock. Adrian likes that too. So they're kind of nine to five guys. And I'm like, let's work till midnight. That's, uh, so uh, we started, we, I took my engineer with me. That's what, he was recording Blackface A, that's also then. And I said, you know, there's this Pro Tools thing. I've got a friend, Gina Fantsayas. She started uh, Blue World E-Sessions. She started E-Sessions. She had an SSL, like, a little bigger than this, actually, in her garage and lived near me. And I became her guinea pig for E-Sessions. I just got divorced. That was all part of it, too. She said, I know you, you don't want to be going on tour. you got a teenage daughter. You're trying to stay home. I'll make, I'll, she bought me my Pro Tools rig. It was about 10 or 15 grand then, right? For 888s and- I remember and it well. G5 it was not whatever. cheap. Yeah. Um, she knew I had a lot of the front end. I had microphones, I had drum gear, and I had some connection to other players. She was maybe trying to reach Tony Levin or somebody like that. Um, so I brought my engineer with the Pro Tools rig, Bill Munyon, and, uh, and we worked in Adrian's garage, and I would just give him, we would take the outtakes. Oh, we're not going to use this jam. Well, let's fuck with this. Take it to the apartment at night and mess around with the arrangement and carry on with that even after we were done. So Project X was made simultaneously. Uh, so you can actually, Demolition is Lark's 4. If you listen, oh, same tempo, same same time signatures, and some different events happened. But you're, you're, you're hinting at it massively here. Robert likes to play live. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to tell you about the fractured thing where I, he, we're playing it, you know, it, we, we, we clam. And we're like, what's going on? There's a drop beat here, drop. I can't, I can't catch up with what the piece is. And I said, Robert, we just lay it down once on tape for me. You know, I'll put a click up and he played through it on tape. So then I could listen to it repeatedly and play to it consistently. But I remember he finished. He said, that's the most miserable recording experience of my life. You know, <laughs> he, he's not, he doesn't like to... Uh, yeah, I have to be forced to play something like that in the studio. Um, he wants to see the energy developed. of working from other musicians. Yeah, yeah, he wanted us all playing together and to put him on the spot there. So we could just play it one time with, without... Which sort of mirrors what, da what David was telling me, is that, and I imagine when people have asked you these kinds of questions before, everybody will probably come in with this idea that Robert Fripp is, is basically a computer and everything has to be absolutely perfect. And David told me with, with David Sylvian, it was the exact opposite. Yeah. David Sylvian was obsessed with everything being perfect. Yeah. 
And if they, if it was breathing, that was the takes that Robert liked. Like a little, oh, there's a little wrong there. That's the one I like. He likes warts and all. He, he's just saying, I, I, did you ever hear this BPM record I made where I took some of Rob, Robert's uh, talking? And he says it right there. I prefer the indiscretions are left in. Uh, these, yeah. All these live recordings. What he did with Bill Munyon. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but after having some of the music together, I said, well, let's put some dialogue and mm-hmm. use this. This Robert had a cassette out then called How I Became a Professional Musician. Mm-hmm. And there's wonderful stuff in there. So, And I'd already had that. So, uh, but, but yeah, the indiscretions are left in. You know, uh, the live things that are released, it's like, whoa, I wouldn't have released that, you know. But <laughs> there you go. It's done. It's out. Yeah. And, um, and I know Bill felt the same way. Yeah. Roof, a lot of those things. He's, you know, you can hear your time rushing. You wouldn't want that to be the one that's on the record. And Yeah. I think for us mere mortals, we love that, though. Yeah. We like to be able to connect to it and still. Yeah, I think people enjoy uh, seeing the accidents and watching how you can recover. Yeah. But then it was like, you know, my wife and I and my son went to see you guys uh Doing level five was just absolutely superb. And I love Tony's introduction. When Tony goes, of all of the periods of Crimson. Oh, he introduced that. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is my favorite period of, of 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 Crimson. And this is, I think he called it the finest drumming moment. He was really very complimentary about you. And it is absolutely superb. Cool. He's very kind. <laughs> I think he's being honest. <laughs> no, Machine, as far as the record, Machine really helped. You know Gene, Machine, that mm-hmm. was our co-producer, engineer on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you feel he brought something to well, it? Well, like a lot of guys, I don't think, know how to incorporate electronic and acoustic drums together. And so they both have muscle and, and, and match. And so that was my problem with some previous recordings. So when we got around to the Power to Believe record, Adrian and Robert said, why don't you pick the engineer? So I, I tried to reach Chad Blake. I did reach Chad Blake and said, Chad, I want you to make this next Crimson record. He wasn't available. He was, anyway. Somebody suggested to me Machine, and the record that, that I really like was called Head P.E., and uh, there's a lot of real visceral drumming and drum machine, and they, 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 they fit. So, uh, and he turned me on to some other things. One I'll turn you on to is uh, a Japanese duo. Uh, Dave Fredman? Yeah, Dave. I tried to reach Dave. He's another, there's a couple, three or four guys I was thinking of. Boom Boom Satellites was sort of, like I was listening to Square Pusher or things like that, and, and uh, trying to think how do I incorporate that into acoustic drumming and stuff that that's boom boom sal- satellites is like they did real drumming and then did their glitch editing i said this, this is what i want to do machine and and so we we got on a common link there and i think it really it, you can see the parallel if you listen to that record to uh uh level five especially which is interesting because i love machines work but i suppose i think of him as a guitar producer because his records are like super heavy guitar orientated rock and um, you're coming in from a drummer's perspective. And totally. You're, you're listening to totally. it from that way, which, yeah. is, which is fantastic. Yeah, he, he makes, makes the right choices and, and, and gets the shit to sound powerful and integrated. I don't want it to sound like a wimpy machine, and, 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 you know. There's a lesson in that, kids. Listen to every member of the band when choosing a producer. Don't just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then picking the studio, too. Trey yeah. and I running around in Nashville trying to pick the studio. We which got, studio? Then? Oh, we ended up at the tracking room, which was like... Wonderful I suggested room, yeah. to... Uh, I think we had our low but Iron Horse. Is Iron Horse a place there? Iron something? Uh, we're like, we had three, Trey and I said, okay, well, here's the low budget one, and here's the medium, and here, this tracking room was like over the top. They'll never go for that. We went back to Adrian and Robert said, here's our three, three suggestions, and they chose, oh, let's go with the tracking room. And the machine, oddly, he doesn't use the monitors in the control room, and he doesn't face the sweet spot. If he, he sits sideways over on his computer, it's like, don't you want to be over? He's, no, 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 nobody listens to music like that. Come on. So he just has little monitors either side of the screen? Not even. No. No, we were doing that tracking? No. How was he listening? Headphones? No, he's, he's, well, he make headphones sometimes or little speakers sometimes, but all the shit that you've just paid for that's up here, he's over here working. He's just hearing it out of one ear, you know? I thought the same thing when we 
mastered the Mister's record at Precision Lacquer. You know mm-hmm. that place. All the other mastering places are like acoustically treated rooms. They sold coffee there. That was like you were in a living room with plants, and it was like the weirdest place to go for mastering. It was like, but it was the real world, I suppose. Yeah, it yeah, sounds that, good there. It's so good. It's anyway. the same point that, that yeah. nobody really listens like. Well, we musicians do, but the general public, you just hear the music across the room. I don't want to skip over, um, I kind of did, um, the, the record you did with uh, Terry Bozier. Okay, the Bomo record, is that what you mm-hmm. mean? We, call, we we did this other tour later with Alan Holdsworth and, and, and Tony, so that was Hobolima or Boholima, depending on mm-hmm. if you put Terry or Alan first. When I first moved to L.A., one of the first guys I played with was signed to Discrete Records, Zappa's label. We rehearsed in Zappa's little room, and that was with Kim Bullard. And uh, in the larger room, Zappa had a, had a band rehearsal going. So every day when I'd come a little bit early, well, the room would stink of cigarettes. I'd open up the door. That's because Tom Waits rehearsed last in that little room. We shared it with three. It was us, this little prog band. Captain Beefheart, and then Tom Waits. So when I come in the morning, the light bulbs are all gone and the room stinks of cigarettes. And then somebody's in the big room going... So later, uh, when I moved to Austin, somebody goes, hey, Terry moved to Austin. So eventually, Terry and I, the phone rings, you know. I just had, when Terry called, I remember, he, I just had a lesson in North Texas State. So what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to learn to play with my heel down because I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a stomper. You know, this, this thing, I think those players are better. better. You wanted to get the beater to come back. And Absolutely. The kick, the kick and, ring. And, and I just would look at whatever Matt Chamberlain or somebody, he's got his heel down again, or, or John Robertson, and these guys with the better feel, time, laid back more. They're not pumping like I do. So Terry called. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to learn how to play with my heel down before we go on tour. What are you doing? He said, I'm just sitting around. We should hook up. So I go over to Terry's house, and we just shoot the shit for a couple days like this back and forth and then about the third day he's got you know he's got a garage full of his drums and gongs and all this stuff and i hit something and he hit something back and we did a lot did a little that thing happened and he pressed record and so we we jammed for a half hour and we listened to it's all distorted just unlistenable and i said terry we should do this again but i'll bring an engineer i'll bring my friend bill over munion so bill because we would play like little tiny shakers and then hit a gong is impossible you can't re- you know <laughs> so bill uh did it like a like a long boom mic with a mm-hmm. fuzzy thing where you walk around and get right in so bill recorded that and uh i think we just did that for a day and then i did some editing and then gave it back to terry and terry oh we got to release it so that's that's that bomo record mm-hmm. it's recorded like that and there's a funny story there that I like that Bill was recording. He said, there was this whistle. I kept trying to figure out, where's this whistle, this whistle? And he realizes eventually it's his own nose breathing because he's got the mic, you know. <laughs> now, of course, you've got the, the duo with Trey. It's just like, it, it feels like you've, this, this, there's so many relationships now with all these guys that you're playing with. You know, you're getting to do duos and... <laughs> And and other little bands on the side, obviously the Stickmen is one of those, but the one with with Trey as well. Yeah, we had a lot of leftover ideas, and mm-hmm. and so when we finished the Power to Believe. I went up to Seattle. Trey was sharing a loft with Matt Chamberlain, and Matt, maybe they weren't even sharing. Matt just said, "Here, take the room." So we recorded that in about a week in in uh, in that loft. Was the Kim, did the uh, Crimson Project come about because you know, like so many of us, there's people that are dying to hear Crimson even when Robert doesn't want to be doing Crimson. Yeah. Uh, and we had job offers. There were offers to play. And we had the two trios. I mean, I, yeah, that was a little odd because they, I think they originally, oh, it was Dream Theater or the agent for Dream Theater, Adrian, me, and Tony to do it as a trio. And, oh, yeah, the, there's some issues there. So then we, We'll resolve the issues by doing the two trios together. We talked to briefly, maybe it was off camera, about uh, the three drummer experience, the seven-headed beast. How was that when you first uh, sat in a room together? Uh, well, we prepared before we ever sat in a room together. Uh, Robert called, uh, shocking to me. I was, remember I was at my desk, you know, working Pro Tools and phone buzz, Robert. What? And uh, he says, I've seen the band together. Get the band back together. I see three drummers. I see, uh, 
I didn't, anyway, I was just so excited that he called. I didn't think about who are the guys when we hung up. Um, and it was a day or three later that Bill Rieflin called me and he says, I guess you know. And I said, no. And he says, well, I, Robert just called. <laughs> oh, so you're one of the drummers. And is <laughs> Gavin the other guy, you know? Uh, and it was Gavin. And uh, so then the three of us set about emailing and all that kind of stuff and sending some little videos back and forth. We flew over to work at Gavin's place for a week, and that week we spent three days on level five and three days on construction of light. And the last day we tried to do a brief run through of a bunch more material just to kind of and uh, realized we got to do this again. We went home, came back a month later, did three days uh, someplace else with with more of our gear. Uh, we did that again, so we could play the material without the guys, the three drummers. We we knew our arrangements of, for the repertoire that we were presenting. How are you running that down? Are you just literally putting the record on well, and playing to it? Yeah, like for example, at St Starless was the one we did on the last day at, at uh, Gavin's house the first day, and we put up a click, and, and Rieflin played bass, and he played the whole song top to bottom with one mistake that we had to punch in. I mean, the whole thing, the coda as well. Incredible. <laughs> and, and so then we could discuss it. And other songs, maybe like Epitaph, I would play it. Well, we knew that Bill was going to play keyboards. So we let Bill be the producer. Who, who should, how should we, let me hear you both play it. Oh, well, Pat's more on top of the beat. Let's have him play it. Otherwise, it sounds too slow. So Gavin will embellish that. So. You know, we just played song by song like that and tried to figure out how to split split the parts and how to, as once you get a lot of them together, you go, well, well it's leaning this way or that way. How do we balance it more? And uh, so we thought about that. And the drum pieces, they started to come. Gavin presented those. Most of those ideas are Gavin's. And uh, rehearsed all that. So the, the real challenge or the real... The moment of truth was when we were rehearsed at Elstree as the whole band uh, the first time. And we know the tunes, but these guys never heard schizoid. We're going to switch every two bars, you know, <laughs> and, and see how this goes down. Robert might pull the plug on the whole thing, but he didn't, you know, so. Uh, and then just fine tune it, you know, all the time you're you're listening. So you realize, oh, last night, shoop happened and I went shoop and then went shoop, shoop between the, oh, that was pretty cool. Let's catch that again. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. after after the show, little little things or, or things the audience might say. Uh, I remember they... Friends and family said, "I love it when you do the uh, the Wimbledon and you sh hit one way over the court and he throw and you skip the guy in the middle." Said, oh, so that's effective. We could do some of these things. We round robin this way. Yeah, there's probably so, a massive visual component to it. As yeah, well. yeah, you're yeah. seeing three drummers on stage. Absolutely. I mean, we knew yeah. the choreography of that had to mm. kind of be scripted. And and as far as charts, Gavin's incredible. He meticulous charts. I, I can't. My charts are horrible, but he could write if we were going to play in other meters he could write here's your part from your perspective here's your part as if you're listening from me mm -hmm. you know same same outcome but it's written in four four or five four or seven eight or whatever each guy's part might so gavin unbelievable and some of the stuff off the old records like learning fracture i could never figure out where those bar lines were because the songs were not in time they you know the the, the tempos were shifting and Gavin actually laid out a chart like, oh, now I see. They weren't rushing. They dropped a beat, you know, um, little things. I want to talk to you about the record you did with your wife. Oh, well, I think I've told the story. But anyway, she came to her first Crim Crimson gig while we were dating in 2008. And, uh, and she had that experience in the bathroom where there was a woman in there, make it stop. And uh, <laughs> I know you said that live at the show the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it ended up in that movie as well. <laughs> but it, it's an old thing. You know, there's no line for the women's bathroom at a Crimson show and all that kind of stuff. Sausage fest, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, she's right. That, you know, we lean too heavily on the... On the um, dagger in the face sometimes you know what what she witnessed also was and i didn't say this was she saw a woman standing in front of adrian with a rose crying while he played walking while we played walking on air which is we got married actually to that piece you know beautiful piece so she saw that the emotional connection is there um anyway so she saw probably more 
shows from the current version of King Crimson, the, the 2013 to 21, than anybody that wasn't on the crew, because Robert didn't mind that she traveled with me. We're getting good hotels and making money. So it's like my new girlfriend, then, then wife. It's like, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, so she witnessed it firsthand, and then uh, the lockdown happened. We'd actually started before the lockdown. Um, we'd, we started using the amazing slower downer. So we sit in a hotel room late at night and think, oh, what, what if we did whatever tune and slowed it way down trying to find a, a key that would work and you know, he could independently do that and uh and uh, so we'd started to record a few of them and then it dawned on me to get the multi-tracks i asked uh dgm give me the multi-tracks from one time and i took the full multi-tracks and slowed them down and stuff like that to to start building the, the tunes and then uh, finding the ones that lyrically resonated with Deborah, uh, you know, from a woman's perspective, and a couple of, like like going after uh, exiles and uh, and trying to find arrangements. Uh, you know, I have limited skills harmonically. I had to get people to help me. To, you know, sort sort of like uh, an Italian guy over in Belgium that helped me with uh, Mata Kudasai. I was sending him. I want this thing from Lost Highway with a low trombone, you know, when they're, I think that's the movie with these low trombones and like, I got to get that feel in here and, you know, the smoky atmosphere of finger snaps. And so he helped me lay that out. The one I use the harp on, I forget. Oh, because I just, we had visited uh, Rieflin. Deborah and I went up to see Bill uh, just pre-COVID at Christmas. Last time we saw him, he died a few months later. So we saw him at Christmas, and he had played us then. He had recorded Schizoid Man with Toya singing it with a harp. And that's when Deborah and I like, light bulb, oh, we got to put a harp on the record somewhere. And it was very hard to find a harp player. Well, you're, you're a busy man. I'm looking here at what you're currently involved in, Stick Men. Obviously, the duo with, with, uh, with Trey. Uh, KTU. Um, I don't know if you say that, K2, but... Uh, we say, we K, say K2. We all, K2. We view okay. it like 2 plus 2. We did the 2 as T-U. Yeah. And I always thought, Trey, if we want to play live, we yep. should get two other people right. and, and do 2 plus 2. And that's we did Chemo and Semuli first. And, uh, yeah. And, and it's not really active, you know. Some oh, music, it? Yeah, we get a biannual European festival, world music, some other, you know... Incredible. Yeah. That still sounds wonderful. And then ORK, Org. That's we've already made four records together. Uh, they called in 2013 or 14, just as Crimson was starting. Sent me some demos. They sound great. I like I like to play on this stuff, but I'm really busy. I can't. I don't have time. And they waited. So like a year later, I go, oh, I I got to do it. And then uh, and then we did some touring. And I liked the guys, and we made the next record. So uh, we're going to start touring. Next month, uh, April, April. So, are you yeah. playing in that area at all? No, th- we can't get that many gigs. Hmm. Uh, it's sad. We we kind of had some momentum going, and we need a big stage, don't you? No, 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 no. no. We're, we're they're just two guys with amplifier. It's so different than Stickman. Like, there's a mm. bass player, there's a guitar player, two different amplifiers. You right. can hear where the and uh, yeah, we don't need a big stage. So you only bring the two. I was looking at the, the members, and uh, I suppose I'd seen more. No, in way. fact, on the upcoming tour, Left doesn't want to play any keyboards. He's going to put backing track, get all his... Oh, okay. He wants to play guitar on stage. He just feels like he looks dumb. So you can't play the, the spud, as it were, the baby potato? Oh, uh, we could. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But we're a rock band. But I guess so was Stickman in a way. I mean, I yeah. think of the baked potato as jazz fusion, but that's I all I don't know. If you're, playing level five, yeah. if you're playing level five in the baked potato, yeah, yeah. it doesn't get I much would, heavier than that. By the last night, I realized I'd play as, as hard as I would in, in an arena. There's really, you know, it's not... Tapered. Everybody we played it. a museum a few days before that, and I definitely put the pads on the drums and played plastics, and then sort of like the frog in the water, you know, every song, take a little pad, loosen it, move to a stick. And we were lined up. Uh, we were there for the, we came to the 10, sh- 10 o'clock show, so we were lined up while you were still, because we wanted to get there early to get good seating, and we, you could hear drums outside. Oh. So, no, but it it sounded phenomenal inside. Absolutely. Uh, I know I'm a loud guy. I can be a loud guy. I can, I can surprise people and play pretty quiet too. But, yeah. but, but, uh, it was, it sounded amazing. The first drummer that really affected me, well, not the first, there was Ginger Baker and Ring and all that, but Buddy Miles. Mm. Buddy Miles. And I saw him play up close 
uh, in a drum store and he took the sticks to the butt end, duba duba duba, and broke the pedal. And I was about, that's was when I got my first drum set. That's how a dude plays, man. That's like total, total commitment. He's not mamby pamby jazzy stuff. So, yeah, I mean, so. he played with Hendrix. So. And, I, and I saw Hendrix. This wasn't with Buddy, but I saw this thing with Buddy Miles happened in the music store in San Francisco. But then a year or so later, or three years later, whatever, I saw Hendrix with Buddy Miles opening Freedom Express. And you could hear the drums powerful through the whole show, outdoor show. Then Kendrix came on with Mitch Mitchell. I couldn't hear Mitch. I could see Mitch. More of a the, jazz the drummer. The wind would blow and you'd hear a little bit of it. And just wispy, not anchored. You know, I love it. But, uh, but in that context, it affected me. I was only like 14 years old, probably. I loved uh, the early 70s, with the Summer Jam record, the one with Santana, with Buddy Miles. Hmm. Remember that yeah. record? Yeah. Uh, they did. They did. He did them changes with Santana playing. Actually, on it. I don't know that. No, it was around Caravan Survive, maybe after that or something. I'm yeah. not sure. But yeah, that, yeah, great stuff. No, I keep a picture of Buddy on my back of my baffle, looking nice. at me in the, in the drum room. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, amazing. Pat, this has been an absolute treat. Thank you ever so much. Unbelievable. Everybody, please leave any comments and questions below. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's been an absolute treat, and the show was phenomenal. Um, we'll have to. How how many more shows have you got with uh, um, with you and Tony and Marcus? Uh, Stickman shows on this tour. There's ten more. We're ten like more. at the halfway point. Or... I don't know if we'll get this video out before you finish, but we'll definitely have a link to your site. <laughs>